the apostles. At that time, when the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributed and resting on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and wondered, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of working, but it is the same God who inspires them all in everyone. 
to which is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. The Word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John.
on the evening of the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. So as we celebrate today the beautiful solemnity of Pentecost, right, the reception of the Holy Spirit by the church and the infusion with that Holy Spirit within the church of that new fire and that love and that power of God to then go out and proclaim the gospel. And there's so many beautiful images of the Holy Spirit that we have throughout Scripture, a luminous cloud or a dove descending from heaven or tongues of fire or a mighty rushing wind all of these beautiful images of how the Holy Spirit operates in those in whom He moves and animates and in whom He lives. And so what we see first and foremost is essential for the reception of the Holy Spirit, which is the forgiveness of sins. And that's what the Lord is speaking about in the Gospel today. It is the evening of the first day, right? This first day of His resurrection, the first day after His passion, the first day of new grace, new life, as the Lord has been raised from the dead. And yet he has not yet appeared to his disciples, but has appeared to the women in the morning. He has appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And now he is going to come in and appear to his apostles in the upper room. They are still afraid. They're terrified. They're terrified because of what they have seen happen to Christ himself. They have shut themselves up in this upper room this last place where he gave them himself in the Eucharist. They've sealed themselves in there, and they are fearful and afraid as to what might happen to them. They are also sorrowful over their failures, the fact that they abandoned and betrayed and left Christ, the fact that they left the one who loved them so completely and that their love was insufficient in return. They sit there in their guilt and in their sin and in their sorrow. And it is into this lack of peace and this inner turmoil that the Lord steps. He simply is present in their midst, powerfully reminiscent of what happens here at the Mass. The Lord is made present here and he does not pass through the doors. He is simply present and stands in our midst at the moment of the consecration in the Mass. And so also here in the upper room, the Lord makes himself present to his disciples, his first consolation in their sorrow, in their turmoil. His presence is peace. And he says to them, peace be with you. Be stilled in your interior. Be stilled in your hearts. Be stilled in your sorrow. Peace be with you. And then in order, as one of the commentators says, to prove his real presence, he shows them his hands and his side. He shows them his wounds, the wounds that he still bears in his body, the wounds of his death, and yet he is living, the great mystery of the passion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This should take our minds to the book of Revelation where you see in heaven on the altar the Lamb who was slain and yet is standing. The Lamb who bears the marks of death and yet is alive. And that is important because at this moment what is the Lord is doing is he is bringing his peace 
but he is also, again, giving us beautiful images as to the reality of what we experience here at the Mass. The Lamb who was slain and yet stands and lives, comes and stands here and is present on this altar. And after he is made present, the same words are spoken over us. Peace be with you. He communicates his peace to us from his presence. And so that is what he does first. He is present to his disciples. He shows them his wounds of love. Then it says, and this is the effects of Christ's presence and of the contemplation of his wounds. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. All of a sudden, the interior movements are turned from sorrow to rejoicing. They are turned from fear to peace and gladness, all because of the presence of Jesus Christ and the contemplation of his wounds. This is a lesson for us in our own lives when we are experiencing times of trial, difficulty, loneliness, sadness, depression, anything that comes. Being in the presence of Christ and the contemplation of the wounds of his passion is what brings us interior joy. Because his presence communicates his love to us. His passion communicates his love to us. And it is in the contemplation of this love that then we are brought to peace. But this love of Christ is not, yet some, is not just something that must stay outside of us that we just think about. The love of Christ is the Holy Spirit. It is a reality that must not only be outside of us, but must be within us. This love that we contemplate in him must be what animates us from within. Just as we are the extension of the Lord's body, his mystical body, no body is complete without a spirit. No complete body is animated without a spirit. And so the mystical body of Christ is animated and driven and infused with the Spirit of Christ. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Now there is a, might be what we think here, is this the moment of Pentecost? No, of course not. So do they receive the Holy Spirit here, or is it in the later, in the upper room with Our Lady, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles from the first reading today? What the Church Fathers, in their consensus, is that what the Lord gives here to his disciples is the grace that is communicated through the sacrament of reconciliation, to forgive sins. So what he gives here in particular, he will give later in its fullness in the upper room, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles today. And so he breathes over them. Just as the first part of this scene takes our minds to the book of Revelation, so the later part of this scene should take our minds back to the book of Genesis. We've heard of these images of the Holy Spirit as a rushing wind, but also here as a breath. When God creates in Genesis, the Holy Spirit is moving over the water like a rushing wind. And so also now, and, in, and at the moment of Pentecost, when the Lord will recreate, that same Holy Spirit will rush over this new creation as a wind. But then also on the, seventh, on the sixth day, when the Lord creates man, in order to give him life as he draws him up from the dust, it says he breathes into him, breathes into him life. And so also what we see here is the Lord breathing over his apostles as he gives new life, most especially through the sacrament of reconciliation and baptism as sins are wiped away, as death is taken from us and life is infused within us. This Holy Spirit then is what we see operating within the church and spoken of in St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. The Holy Spirit, like that beautiful wind and like those tongues of fire, causes apostles to increase in their love, 
and also then to move out and proclaim with the gifts that come through the Holy Spirit all of the mystery of Christ's gospel. The gifts that come to the, through the Holy Spirit, what we were looking at in the second reading, are particularly charismatic gifts, gifts for others, gifts for others. They are not for the recipient themselves, but in order to be shared. And so what we pray for today, as we give thanks for this gift of the Holy Spirit, we pray for a new Pentecost, a renewal of the Holy Spirit within our own selves and in our own life, but also within the church, that the Holy Spirit who comes as a tongue of fire will set us all on fire again, and that the Holy Spirit who moves like a rushing wind will move us according to God's will with each step. We pray for the grace, like Our Lady, to be docile to the Holy Spirit. And that's the last point. Before the reception of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the Church is gathered with prayer, gathered in prayer with Our Lady. And that is not an insignificant detail. She is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. She is the one who takes the infant church under her care in the upper room, and she teaches that church how to pray. In union, in that deep union of prayer with Our Lady, that is when the church receives the outpouring of not only the gifts from heaven, but the gift from heaven, the Holy Spirit. It is to this united prayer with Our Lady that the Spirit rushes. Wherever she is, he is sure to follow. In whatever heart Our Lady enters, the Holy Spirit will be next. In whatever mind that contemplates the mysteries and the beauty of Our Lady, the Holy Spirit will be at work. In whatever soul loves Our Lady, that is already a sign of the Holy Spirit at work in that soul. Amen.